Shalom, and I would like to welcome everybody to the Hebraic Heritage Ministries Yeshiva Discipleship Program. We are currently doing a series on the biblical festivals. This will be our first session on the subject of the Feast of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. In this session, we are going to be discussing the themes of Yom Kippur. In looking at the themes of Yom Kippur, some of the major themes that are associated with this biblical festival is the following. Number one, it is known as the Day of Atonement. Yom in Hebrew is Day, Kippur is Atonement. So the Hebrew name for this holiday is Yom Kippur, which means in English, the Day of Atonement. This is the day in the year when the God of Israel designated that he would forgive the sins of the nation of Israel. Number two, this festival is known as Face to Face. On Yom Kippur is when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies. And in going into the Holy of Holies, it is said that the high priest was in the presence of the God of Israel. The Hebrew word for presence is face. When you're in the presence of the God of Israel, this is associated with and connected with the face of the God of Israel. So being in his presence the idiomatic phrase associated with this is face to face. Number three, this is known as the day. This day is recognized as being the most holiest day in the year. It is a day that we humble ourselves and in doing so by repenting of our sins, this is the day that the God of Israel designated on his calendar that he would forgive the sins of his people in a national way. Number four, this festival is known as the fast. It is on Yom Kippur that the way in which this festival is celebrated in addition to confessing our sins, it is a fast day. The scripture actually says it's the day of the afflicting of our soul and that is interpreted to be fasting. Number five, this festival is known as the Great Shofar. In traditional Judaism, at the end of the Yom Kippur service, the last part of the service is known as Nila, or the closing of the gates. It is at this part of the service where a shofar will be blown. This shofar is known as the great shofar. Looking now at Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement, the Hebrew word for atonement is Kippur. It is the Strong's number 3725. The Hebrew word Kippur comes from the Hebrew root word Kafar, which is the Strong's number 3722. And kafar means to cover, to purge, to make atonement, to make reconciliation, to forgive, to appease, to pacify, or to pardon. So Yom Kippur means the day that our sins are forgiven and reconciliation is made with the God of Israel. So Yom Kippur is the designated day in the festival season that the God of Israel established wherein he would forgive the sins of the nation of Israel once they repented. Yom Kippur is associated with the forgiveness that the God of Israel granted unto his people for committing the sin of the golden calf. In Midrash Seder Alam, which is the order of the world, the chronology of the events that have taken place in the world since 
the creation of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, in Midrash Seder Olam Rabbah 6, it gives a chronology of the period of time between the receiving of the Torah at Mount Sinai and the following 10th day of Tishrei, or Yom Kippur. On the 6th day of Sivan, the Ten Commandments were given. On the seventh day of Sivan, the very next day, Moses, or Moshe, ascended the mountain. And Moshe then remained on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. On the 40th day, which was the 17th of Tammuz, he descended where he found the nation of Israel sinning by worshiping the golden calf. And as a result, he broke the tablets which contained the Ten Commandments. Following that, Moshe ascended the mountain the second time, this would be on the 18th of Tammuz, to seek compassion from the God of Israel because of the sin of the golden calf. Moses remained on the mountain for another period of 40 days and 40 nights, the second 40-day and 40-night period that he spent up on the mountain. After that time, Moshe descended on the 28th of Av, and he hewn a second set of tablets. Then on the 29th of Av, Moshe ascended Mount Sinai the third time. So if we look at these events on a timeline in reviewing what we just mentioned, we can see then that on the 6th of Sivan is when the house of Jacob received the Torah and the commandments that were given unto them by the God of Israel. Then the next day, the 7th of Sivan to the 17th of Tammuz, Moses is up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Then he comes down and he sees the nation of Israel committing the sin of the golden calf. Then he goes back up to the mountain for another 40 days and 40 nights. This culminates in it being the 28th of Av. And on the 29th of Av, he comes back down from the mountain. And then the third period of time of being on the mountain concludes with him coming down the third time from Mount Sinai. That day, according to the rabbis, was the 10th of Tishrei, or Yom Kippur. Now, if we look at this in the scriptures, in Deuteronomy, or Devarim, chapter 10, and verse 10, it says, And I stayed in the mount according to the first time, 40 days and 40 nights, which the rabbis associate those 40 days and 40 nights with being from the 7th of Sivan to the 17th of Tammuz. And the Lord hearkened unto me at that time also, and the Lord would not destroy you. Moshe descended from Mount Sinai the third time, according to the rabbis, on the 10th of Tishrei, and this is the day that would be designated by the God of Israel as Yom Kippur. Therefore, that day was established as a decree and a remembrance for all generations. In Leviticus, or Vayikra, chapter 16 and verse 34, it is written, And this shall be an everlasting statute unto you to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. Yom Kippur is known as the fast day or the day of afflicting the soul. And Leviticus or Vayikra chapter 23 and verse 27 is where it tells us that Yom Kippur is a day of afflicting the soul. Traditional Orthodox Jewish interpretation interprets the afflicting of the soul as refraining from all bodily pleasures. The rabbis interpret there are five major Yom Kippur afflictions, and they are abstaining from eating, drinking, washing, or anointing the body, 
wearing leather shoes and marital relations. Yom Kippur is the day when white garments were worn by the high priest. It is an Orthodox Jewish custom of wearing white clothing on Yom Kippur, which is meant to emulate the ministering angels. Some people wear a kittle, which is a white robe worn over their clothing. They would wear this on Yom Kippur and for the Yom Kippur service. It is an Orthodox Jewish custom that the kittle should not be decorated with gold because gold recalls the sin of the golden calf and Yom Kippur is a day of divine forgiveness from the God of Israel and it was originally associated with forgiveness from the sin of the golden calf. We are told in the Bible that angels wear white garments. The ministering angels of the God of Israel wear white clothing. During the events of the resurrection of Yeshua in Matthew chapter 28 verses 2 and 3, it is written, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. White garments is associated with our sins being forgiven. In Leviticus chapter 13 verse 17 it is written, And the priest shall see him, and behold, if the plague be turned into white, and then the priest shall pronounce him clean that has the plague, he is clean. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 8 it is written, Let your garments be always white and let your head lack no ointment. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18, it is written, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So your sins being red like crimson is associated with whoredom. Because we're told in the scriptures that the nation of Israel, by breaking the commandments of the God of Israel, was an unfaithful wife and committed whoredom with the other nations around them and followed after their God. So even though your sins be according to that, they shall be, once you repent of your sins, as white as snow, completely forgiven. White garments also represent purity and righteous deeds done by the people of the God of Israel. White garments are symbolic of purity and righteous deeds. The bride of Messiah is an overcomer whose sins are forgiven, whose heart is pure, and who has righteous deeds. In Revelation chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, it is written, You have a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Notice, not defiling your garments. Their garments are white. He that overcomes the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. In Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 and 8, it is written, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints, or the righteous deeds, or the righteous acts of saints. Now let's look at the Yom Kippur high priest ceremony and see the spiritual meaning and application of the events that happened with the high priest and the ceremony which he is commanded to do, which is found in Leviticus in chapter 16. The ceremony of the high priest on Yom Kippur is detailed for us in Leviticus chapter 16. The primary purpose 
of this ceremony is to bring atonement for the entire nation of Israel for their sins committed during the previous year. In Leviticus chapter 16 verse 30 it is written, For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you and to make you clean from all your sins before the Lord. The spiritual application to this is that Yeshua is our high priest. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, it is written, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Messiah Yeshua. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, it is written, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Yeshua, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without Sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Even as the high priest made intercession for the nation of Israel on Yom Kippur, Yeshua makes intercession for us. In Romans chapter 8 verse 34 it is written, Who is he that condemns? It is Messiah that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. In understanding Yom Kippur and the association with us repenting of our sins, one of the Hebrew words for repentance is teshuva. Teshuva comes from the Hebrew root word shuv. Shuv is the Strong's number 7725, which means to return, turn back, to restore, refresh, or repair. The rabbis teach that the God of Israel created the concept of repentance before he created the heavens and the earth. And this is found in Nedarim 39b. Because the God of Israel would not create the world being all-knowing and knowing that man would sin without giving him an opportunity to repent. Yom Kippur is when we specifically are commanded to analyze and consider what we have done in our lives and to confess the sins that we have committed against the God of Israel. And Mishnah Torah Chilchot Teshuvah 1.1 Rambam, that is Moses Maimonides, explains that should a person transgress any commandment of the Torah, whether it is a positive commandment or a negative commandment, whether it is done intentionally or inadvertently, and desires to repent from his sins, he should make a verbal confession of that sin. We can see this principle in Numbers, in chapter 5, in verses 5 through 7, as it is written. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, When a man or woman shall commit any sin that men commit to do a trespass against the Lord, and that person be guilty, then they shall confess their sin which they have done, and he shall recompense his trespass, with the principle thereof, and add unto it the fifth part thereof, and give it unto him against whom he has trespassed. In Psalm chapter 32 and verse 5, it is written, I acknowledge my sin unto you, and my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. In Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13, it is written, He that covers his sins shall not prosper, but whosoever confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. This promise that if we confess our sins, that the God of Israel through Yeshua the Messiah will forgive us of our sins is found in 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, as it is written. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess 
our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How are we to confess our sins? The Hebrew word for confession is vidui. It is taught that there cannot truly be total repentance without confession of our sin. When David sinned with Bathsheba, the God of Israel sent the prophet Nathan to rebuke him. And this is found in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1-12. through 12. After Nathan's rebuke of King David, David replied with these words that are found in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Before David confessed that he had sinned against the God of Israel, there is a blank space in the Hebrew text. The Vilna Gaon, this is an Orthodox Jewish rabbi, explains the significance of the blank space before David's response. There was a silence after Nathan's stern words. David was engaged in an inner struggle. He could have justified his deed, or he could admit that the prophet was right, whom the God of Israel sent. Finally, David made his decision, and he said, I have sinned. David's response remains a prototype of confession and repentance. David's lengthy confession and prayer to the God of Israel is recorded in Psalm or Tehillim 51. Repentance must have serious thought, frank admission, and verbal expression of how we have sinned and how we hope to improve in the future. This thought is given in the Art Scroll Masorah, which is the Yom Kippur Ashkenaz Makzor, which is the prayer book, and it is found on page 69. Now, let's look at Psalm 51, and let's read about David's confession of his sin and how it was done. Psalm 51, verse 1, begins by saying, A psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. I want you to notice here that David is making a plea unto the God of Israel to be forgiven of his sins based upon the mercy that the God of Israel extends unto his people who confess their sins. Psalm 51 verse 2, Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. So he asked the God of Israel to forgive his sins based upon the mercy that the God of Israel grants and forgiving sin, and David confesses his sin and says, I acknowledge my transgression. Psalm 51, verse 4. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you might be justified when you speak and be clear when you judge. See, we need to realize when we sin, we're actually sinning against the God of Israel. When we sin, it grieves and it hurts his heart. We all love him enough that we don't want to hurt his heart. So if we think about that when we do sin, how it grieves his heart, perhaps it may allow us to stop and think and reconsider what we're doing. Psalm 51 verse 5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you shall make me to know wisdom. What is the hidden part? That's the heart. He wants me to love him with my heart. It's with my heart that he's going to teach me wisdom. What is wisdom? It is the knowledge and the understanding of the ways of the God of Israel, his word or his Torah. Psalm 51 verse 7, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. That is speaking about that our sins are completely forgiven. Psalm 51 verse 8, Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, 
O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Put a spirit in me that wants to obey you, honor you, love you, not a spirit that breaks your commandments. Cast me not away from your presence. And if we're not cast away from his presence, what are we? Face to face. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. In other words, don't let the guilt of the sin remain with me if it's been forgiven. Allow a pure heart to be in me and allow me to live for the God of Israel with a pure heart and a joyful heart. Then it says, Psalm 51 verse 13, Then will I teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted unto you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The joy of knowing that our sins are forgiven. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you desire not sacrifice, else would I give it. You delight not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure unto Zion, build you the walls of Jerusalem. Then shall you be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then shall they offer bullocks upon your altar. I want you to notice what David is saying, the way in which the God of Israel accepts burnt offerings and bullocks upon the altar. It has to be done with a broken heart and a repentant heart. In other words, our hearts have to be right because he says earlier, which we just read, that if our hearts are not right, he doesn't desire burnt offerings and he doesn't desire bullocks upon the altar. That those things he only accepts if our hearts are first right before him. If our hearts aren't right, he doesn't accept those things. The Torah says that we must confess our sins and the sins of our forefathers. In Leviticus chapter 26, verses 38 and 39, it is written, And you shall perish among the heathen, and the land of your enemies shall eat you up. And they that are left of you shall pine away in their iniquities in your enemies' lands, and also in the iniquities of their fathers shall they pine away with them. If you will confess your iniquity, and confess the iniquity of your fathers with their trespass, which they have trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that I also have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember, and I will remember the land. What is he speaking about? I will remember my covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will remember the land. He's talking about the promise that he made to the forefathers that when the people of the God of Israel would sin and he would scatter them in the nations, the promise he made to them that if they would repent of their sins, he would regather them from the nations where they had been scattered and bring them back to the land of Israel and he would make things better for them than what it ever was for the forefathers originally. So I want you to notice that there's individual sins that we can commit, but also there are corporate sins that affect us. The sins of our forefathers also affect us and our relationship unto the God of Israel. In traditional Christianity, we, we usually just focus on individual sin rather than realizing that there's consequences that are a part of our lives from how our forefathers lived in the sins of our forefathers. You see, the way in which we express our faith under the God of Israel today, being believers in Yeshua the Messiah, this generation didn't decide how we was going to do it. We express that faith from how it was handed down to us from our forefathers. 
ultimately we have to go back and understand the history of our faith and then in doing that we can see where our forefathers have committed iniquity so that we are then able to confess not only our sins but the sins of our forefathers we can see that Nehemiah had this understanding and in Nehemiah in chapter 1 when the captives were coming back from Babylon those who were taken there from the southern kingdom as is recorded in Nehemiah chapter 1 Nehemiah realizes that he has to confess his sins and the sins of his forefathers and this is his prayer in Nehemiah in chapter 1 beginning in verse 2 continuing on through verse 6 as it is written that Hanani one of my brethren came he and certain men of Judah and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped which were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem and they said unto me the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach the wall of Jerusalem also is broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire and it came to pass when i heard these words that i sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the god of heaven and said i beseech you o lord god of heaven the great and awesome god that keeps covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments he's quoting there from exodus chapter 20 and verse 6 let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servants which i pray before you now day and night for the children of israel your servants and confess the sins of the children of israel which we have sinned against you both i and my father's house have sinned daniel understood that the god of israel required that he confess his sins and the sins of his forefathers this is recorded for us in daniel in chapter 9 verses 2 through 5 and then verse 8 11 15 and 19 as it is written in the first year of his reign i daniel understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the lord came to jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Once again, quoting from Exodus chapter 20, verse 6. It is from Exodus 20, verse 6, that Yeshua said in John 14, verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. Daniel chapter 9, verse 5, We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from your precepts and from your judgments. O Lord, to us belongs confusion of face to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers because we have sinned against you. Now in Daniel chapter 9, verse 11, 15, and 19, it is written, Yea, all Israel have transgressed your Torah, even by departing, that they may not obey your voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us in the oath that is written in the Torah of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. And now, O Lord our God, that have brought your people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and have gotten you renown as it is this day, we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive, O Lord, hearken and do, defer not, for your own sake, O oh my God, for your city and your people that are called by your name. In confessing our sins and the sins of our forefathers, we need to, among other things, confess the sins of Jeroboam. What are the sins of Jeroboam? What did Jeroboam do? Well, Jeroboam built a golden calf system of worship and didn't obey the Torah of the God of Israel. Jeroboam set up a substitute place of worship, a substitute priesthood, and substitute holidays. In 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 25-33, through 33, it is written, 
Then Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein and went out from there and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. In other words, he's looking out what he perceives as his own interests and not the interests of the people as it relates to the covenant that the God of Israel made with his people as it relates to keeping his commandments. First Kings chapter 12, verse 28, Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, O Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt, making a reference that what he is doing is compared to Exodus 32 and the golden calf. It is trying to allow the reader to understand that this is the equivalent to the golden calf or a golden calf system of worship. So we need to understand the characteristics of this golden calf system of worship. And he set one in Bethel, which in Hebrew means the house of God, and the other he put in Dan. And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one even unto Dan. And he made a house of high places, and he made priests of the lowest of the people who were not the sons of Levi. What, does, what did the God of Israel say in the Torah? That the teachers of the people were to be priests, and they were to be of the Levitical family. The children of Israel worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of sex and fertility. Judges chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, it is written, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and served Baalim. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods, of the gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord, and served Baal and Ashtoreth. Ashtoreth, becomes Ishtar, which becomes Easter. The Easter eggs and the Easter bunnies and those things are associated historically with the worship of Ishtar and the worship of the fertility of the land. It is some of these customs which we have inherited from our forefathers which can be directly traced back to the days of Constantine. Next, we need to confess the sin of putting up Asherah trees. The children of Israel set up Asherah trees. We can see this from Jeremiah, Yermiyahu, chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, as it is written. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaks unto you, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, Learn not the ways of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cuts a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. We can see here the connection with what we today put up a Christmas tree and decorate it. So here we're told in Jeremiah chapter 10 of the custom that the nation of Israel were doing in their days, which is very similar to the custom that we have today. Where does this custom come from in Christianity? Does it go back to the first century? Does it go back to Yeshua and the disciples in the book of Acts? No, it is really traced back to the days of Constantine. And what we have done, we've inherited the things that our fathers have done, and we continue those things by custom and tradition, generation after generation. And so this is a part of confessing our sins and the sins of our forefathers. And confessing our sins and seeing the connection here with what we did and how it paralleled also what the nation of Israel did, we are now going to look at 2 Kings chapter 17 and verses 32 and 33. Here it says, So they feared the Lord. Is that good or bad? 
That's good, because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So notice it says that they feared the Lord, and then it says, They made unto themselves of the lowest of them priests of the high places, which sacrificed for them in the houses of the high places. So they're doing something which the God of Israel didn't command, and they're doing it in the context that what they're doing, they're doing it through the fear of the Lord. They're doing what they're doing with respect and reverence unto the God of Israel, yet what they're doing is not what he commanded. Verse 33, They feared the Lord and served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from there. And it goes on in Second Kings chapter 17, verse 34 through 41, which is the end of the chapter. And it says that they fear not the Lord, neither did they keep his commandments, which he commanded them at Mount Sinai. But instead, they feared the Lord by worshiping the Lord according to their own ways. And so if we look at that in the context of confessing our sins and the sins of our forefathers, by growing up in traditional Christianity, my testimony from the people that I have been around is this. The vast, vast majority of people who attend traditional Christianity church on Sunday, they are people who are there that love the God of Israel that want to do the will of the God of Israel, that fear and honor the God of Israel. So they're doing what they're doing with good hearts, except not everything that they do are they doing according to how the God of Israel commanded that he wanted to be worshipped. When the Torah tells us, to confess our sins and the sins of our forefathers, these are some of the things that we need to understand so that we are able to confess our sins and the sins of our forefathers. Well, part of the punishment that the God of Israel gave unto specifically the northern kingdom when they broke the covenants that he made with them at Mount Sinai. It tells us in Hosea, in chapter 2, verse 2, and then verse 5 and verse 11, that he would take away the celebration of the festivals and the joy that's associated with celebrating these things. Hosea chapter 2, verse 2 says, Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. For their mother has played the harlot. She that conceived them has done shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers that give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, mine oil and my drink. I will also cause all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, and her Sabbaths, and all her solemn feasts. So, historically, in looking at traditional Christianity, going back to the days of Constantine, when a decision was made by Constantine, which ultimately got carried out generation by generation, now we're 1,700 years after that, to not keep the commandments of the God of Israel in the context of celebrating the Sabbath and the annual biblical festivals. As a result of setting up an alternative system of worship, rather than keeping these specific commandments, we ended up bringing in a substitute holiday system and teachers of the ways of the God of Israel, which is not based upon teaching his people to follow Torah. And as a result, the God of Israel then took away from our worship the celebration of the Sabbath and the annual festivals, just like he did unto the northern kingdom historically. Now, In the end of days, though, we are told that in the last generation that precedes the coming of Yeshua to rule and reign during the Messianic era, we would be able to look back and see all these things. He would outpour his Holy Spirit and open up our eyes, and we would ultimately do what is prophesied in Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 19 which is written, O Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction. What's the day of affliction? The tribulation period. The Gentiles shall come unto you from the ends of the earth. Where did he scatter his people for breaking the covenant? To the ends of the earth. And they will 
say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and things wherein there is no profit. In order to understand how we've inherited lies, you've got to know what the truth is. Because the lie is the opposite of the truth. What is truth? Psalm 119, verse 142. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your Torah is truth. So if we've inherited lies, it means we've inherited a belief system that doesn't identify with and follow Torah that we will recognize and understand in the end of days, specifically and corporately in the day of affliction, and we will confess our sins and the sins of our forefathers. Guess what the God of Israel will do? He will redeem us and bring us back to the land as he promised in Leviticus in chapter 26. We need to confess that Yeshua is Mashiach, that Yeshua is Messiah. In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, it is written, that if you will confess with your mouth Yahweh Yeshua, and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. 1 John chapter 4, verse 15. Whosoever shall confess that Yeshua is the Son of God, God dwells in him, and he in God. So when we repent of our sins and confess our sins, we not only have to confess of our sins and the sins of our forefathers, but in confessing our sins, we need to confess that Yeshua is Messiah. Now in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, it is written, Wherefore God has highly exalted him, that is Yeshua, and given him a name which is above every name, that is the name of Yeshua every knee should bow, of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Yeshua HaMashiach is Yahweh, to the glory of God the Father. You see, we haven't truly confessed our sins and repented of our sins unless we receive the forgiveness that is offered by Yeshua when he died on the tree to make atonement for our sins, to give us forgiveness of our sins, and thus in doing so proclaiming that Yeshua is Yahweh. Yeshua, in his shed blood, was shed for the purpose of forgiving our sins. By confessing and repenting of our sins, the blood of Yeshua cleanses us from all our sins. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 to 28, it is written, And as they were eating, Yeshua took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. We can also see how the blood of Yeshua forgives us of our sins from Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, and also Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. And from Yeshua HaMashiach, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. The blood of bulls and goats cannot take away our sins. Our sins are only forgiven by the blood of Yeshua. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, it is written, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Today is when we are and should repent. In the Talmud, Shabbat 153a, Rabbi Eliezer encourages us to spend each day in repentance. Rabbi Eliezer said, Repent one day before your death. His disciples ask him, Does then anyone know on which day he will die? Then all the more reason that he repent today, he replied, lest he die tomorrow and thus his whole life should be spent in repentance. We are told that today is the day which we should repent and hear the voice of the God of Israel. In Hebrews chapter 3 verse 15 it is written, While it is said today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart, as in the provocation. And the subject of repentance at the time of death, it is written in Mishnah Torah, Chilchot Teshuvah 1.3 and in 2.1, 
Rambam, or Moses Maimonides, explains that if one has been wicked for his entire life, but repents at the end of his life, he is forgiven. In Ezekiel 33, verse 12, it is written, The wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turns from his wickedness. Now let's look at the repentant thief who asked for his sins to be forgiven on the day of his death when he also hung on the tree while Yeshua was hanging on the tree in the process of being crucified. In Luke chapter 23, verses 39 through 43, it is written, And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If you be Mashiach, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do not you fear God, seeing you are in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man, Yeshua, has done nothing amiss. He doesn't deserve the punishment that we are receiving. And he said unto Yeshua Yahweh, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Yeshua said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shall you be with me in paradise. What is complete repentance or complete Yeshua? How do we know when we have completely repented of our sin? In Mishnah Torah Chot Teshuvah 2.1, Rambam, Moses Maimonides explains that someone who does complete repentance is when someone who has sinned and is faced with the same opportunity to repeat his sin but refrains from doing so because he wishes to repent from that sin. That is complete repentance. In Mishnah Torah, in chapter 2 and Verse 1 is where we can see these words written. How is a sinner supposed to repent? In Mishnah Torah, Hilchot Teshuvah 2.2, Rambam, Moses Maimonides, explains that a sinner should abandon his sinfulness, drive it from his thoughts, and conclude in his heart that he will never do it again. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 7, it is written, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon our sins are forgiven through the righteousness of Yeshua in Romans chapter 3 verses 24 through 26 it is written being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Messiah Yeshua whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believes in Yeshua. Yeshua is our atonement. In Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it is written, for he has made him, that is Yeshua, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In confessing our sins, in Mishnah Torah Hilchot Teshuvah 2.9, Rambam, or Moses Maimonides, explains that teshuva or repentance and Yom Kippur only atones for sins between man and the God of Israel but sins between one man and another are not forgiven until one gives the other his due and appeases him this thought is also found in the Talmud in Yoma 85b Yeshua taught that we should be reconciled with our brother before we approach the altar of the God of Israel to ask for forgiveness unto him. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24, it is written, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has ought against you, leave there your gift before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. In other words, seek forgiveness from your brother who 
you need to make reconciliation with before you ask forgiveness of the God of Israel. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, Yeshua taught us about forgiving others as it is written. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So not only do we ask to be forgiven of sins that we have committed unto somebody else, but if they ask us to forgive them of their sins which they've committed against us, we are commanded to forgive them of their sins if we want to be forgiven of our sins unto the God of Israel himself. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 and 22, Yeshua taught us about forgiving others as it is written. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Seven times? Yeshua said unto him, I say not unto you unto seven times, but seventy times seven. Seven in the Bible is the number of completion or perfection. So really what Yeshua is saying, not seven times, but seven times seven, till it is ultimately and completely forgiven. Yeshua taught us a parable regarding forgiving others if we want to be forgiven by our Heavenly Father. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 23 through 35, it is written, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents. But forasmuch as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what he had done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave you all your debt because you wanted me to do so. Should not you also have compassion on your fellow servant, even as I had pity on you? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. So Yeshua emphasized the importance of forgiving others and accepting the forgiveness of others when they request to be forgiven. We just have covered many of the principles of forgiveness when they ask to be forgiven what is required of them to do. We are exhorted to forgive our brother of their sin against us even as we have to ask forgiveness that we've done unto our brother if we want to be forgiven by our Heavenly Father whom we are in great trespass against without His mercy and compassion that he would bestow upon us through Yeshua and his shed blood on the tree for the forgiveness of our sins. Yeshua even forgave those who crucified him. In Luke chapter 23, verses 33 and 34, it is written, And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right side and the other on the left. Then said Yeshua, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do, and they parted his raiment and cast lots. There are three ways in which we can seek to be forgiven of our sins. We can repent out of love for the God of Israel, because we don't want to hurt his heart. We can repent out of fear or reverence for the God of Israel, because we don't want to face the consequences. Or we can repent to the God of Israel because we don't repent and have to go through suffering. And the suffering causes us to repent. And looking at these ways of repenting, in the Talmud in Yoma 86a and 86b it is written, Rabbi Hama, son of Hanina, said, Great is 
repentance, for it brings healing to the world, as it is said, I will heal their backsliding, I will love them freely. Hosea chapter 14, verse 4. Rabbi Hama, son of Hanina, pointed out a contradiction. It is written in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 22, Return, you backsliding children, speaking about those who were formerly backsliding, and then it is written, I will heal your backsliding. He answered, This is no difficulty. In the one case, the reference is where they return out of love, and the other is when they return out of fear. Now let's look at repentance from suffering. Rob Judah pointed out this contradiction. It is written, Return, ye backsliding children, I will heal your backsliding. But it is also written, For I am a Lord unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 14. This is no contradiction. The one verse speaks of a return out of love or fear, the other when it comes as a result of suffering. Rabbi Jonathan said, Great is repentance because it brings about redemption, as it is said, and a redeemer will come to Zion and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob. Referring to Isaiah chapter 59 verse 20. Why will a redeemer come to Jacob? Because of those that turn from transgression in Jacob. Yom Kippur is known as the day. Yom Kippur is the most holy day of the biblical year because the entire day is spent fasting, praying, and repenting. It is known as the day. Yom Kippur is known as the fast day. Yom Kippur is a day of afflicting your soul. In Leviticus 23, verse 27, it is written, Also, on the tenth day of the seventh month, There shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3, And he humbled, which in Hebrew means afflicted you, and and suffered you to hunger. Yom Kippur, the rabbis teach there are certain individuals, even though it is a fast day, that are not obligated to fast. Who are these? Well, the rabbis teach that if someone is suffering from a medical condition or a potentially life-threatening illness where fasting would cause possibly life-threatening implications, then the rabbis teach that under those circumstances, Yom Kippur fasting is forbidden for this person. Why? Leviticus chapter 18 verse 15 says, If you will keep my commandments and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them, I am the Lord. When you keep his commandments, the purpose is so that we would live, not die. So if by keeping his commandments, if you have a medical condition and fasting would cause harm unto you because of your medical condition, then you would not be required to fast on Yom Kippur. In Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 15, it is written, And you shall be exceedingly careful to guard your lives, is what it says in the Hebrew. The purpose of keeping the commandments is in order to live or guard our lives. Therefore, it is forbidden to fast on Yom Kippur for those who would suffer an adverse medical condition as a result of fasting. In addition, the rabbis teach that those under nine years of age also should not fast on Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is known by the idiom of face to face. When the high priest or the Kohen Haggadol went into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur, he was in the divine presence of the God of Israel. The Hebrew word for being in the presence of the God of Israel is panim, which means face. Panim is the Strong's number 6440. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 8 it is written, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence, which literally means in Hebrew the face, of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Yom Kippur is known as face to face. Moses was in the face or the presence of the God of Israel when he was at Mount Sinai. In Exodus chapter 33 and verse 11, it is written, And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaks unto his friend. In the book written by Arthur Waskow entitled Seasons of Our Joy, his chapter on Yom Kippur is entitled Face to Face. 
Yom Kippur is known as Nila, or the closing of the gates. In traditional Judaism, the final service of Yom Kippur is known as Nila. The Hebrew word Nila means closing or locking. According to the Talmud, Nila alludes to the closing of the temple gates at the end of the day. Nila also refers to the closing of the gates of heaven at nightfall when the day's prayers are over. And this is found in the Jerusalem Talmud in Berahot 4.1. And looking at Nila being the closing of the gates, according to Jewish tradition, the gates of heaven are opened on Yom Teruah or Rosh Hashanah to receive the prayers of those who are repenting before the God of Israel. According to Jewish tradition, the moment of atonement is at the end of Yom Kippur at the time of the Nila service. On Yom Teruah or Rosh Hashanah is when we are to be inscribed in the Book of Life. But it is on Yom Kippur and during the Nila service that the rabbis teach where you are sealed in the book of life. Believers in Yeshua the Messiah are sealed in the book of life, the Lamb's book of life, by the Ruach HaKodesh. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, it is written, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Yom Kippur is associated with the great shofar. At the conclusion of the Nila service for Yom Kippur, a shofar is blown. This shofar is known as the Great Shofar. This shofar is an allusion to the Great Shofar that would be blown to gather the exiles of Israel and to announce the coming of King Messiah. This thought is found in the Art Scroll Menorah series Yom Kippur on page 765 in the Machzor, the prayer book for Yom Kippur. In Isaiah chapter 27, verse 13, it is written, And it shall come to pass in that day, the Messianic times, that the great trumpet shall be blown, and they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria, and the outcasts in the lands of Egypt, and they shall worship the Lord in the holy mount at Jerusalem. When Yeshua returns at his second coming, it will be at the sound of a great shofar. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 29 through 31, it is written, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, which is a reference back to the book of Daniel, with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the earth to the other. This is going to conclude our teaching on the themes of Yom Kippur and in looking at the themes of Yom Kippur we examined the following Yom Kippur is the day of atonement Yom Kippur is associated with face to face Yom Kippur is known as the day or the great day it is the day of fasting or the afflicting of our soul and on this day a great shofar or a great trumpet is blown And this trumpet is blown in traditional Judaism at the end of their Yom Kippur service in that part of the service that is known as Nila, or the closing of the gates. Yom Kippur is the day that is designated by the God of Israel where his people would repent and he would forgive the sins of the entire nation of Israel. And examining this, we looked at the issue of repentance and how we are to confess our sins and the manner in which the God of Israel forgives us of our sins. So we have committed sins against the God of Israel and we've committed sins against our fellow brethren that we need to be forgiven of. Our sins are ultimately forgiven by Yeshua, who is our high priest, who makes intercession for us, and our sins are forgiven 
when we receive his atoning work when he died on the tree and he shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. I pray that this message has been a blessing to you. Let us always remember the words that come from 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. He who says that he abides in him, he who says he's a believer in Yeshua the Messiah, ought himself to walk, that is to live our lives, even as he walked. And how did he live his life under the Heavenly Father as an example to us? He kept the commandments of the God of Israel and Yeshua said if you love him John chapter 14 verse 15 keep my commandments Shalom in Yeshua the Messiah Amen oh,